This is where you need to be a better evolutionary biologist than they are. I am serious. The way to, to, to I guess, to understand and challenge evolutionary theory is to know it better than the people who practice it. Natural selection is not a magic wand. You can't just wave it around and say, bing, there's a, there's a butterfly proboscis. Natural selection as a theory of change has evidential demands that have to be satisfied. If you're going to invoke natural selection, you have to provide the evidence that the theory requires. And it has three necessary conditions, right? They're like three legs of a stool. You have to have them in order to say that natural selection was operating. Here they are. You've got to have variation. Just look around this room. There is a lot of variation in the species Homo sapiens. Height, hair color, eye color, intelligence. Probably we shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> Selection. Those variations have to make a difference to the number of offspring you produce. All right? And lastly, you've got to be able to pass those variations on. You have to be able to transmit them from parent to offspring. Now, these are rules. They are rules that the theory of natural selection itself gives you. You have to provide the evidence. Again, very much like three legs of a stool. Now, for butterflies, and really for any developing animal, the mystery is here at heredity. Because the kinds of variations that you need to build butterflies where they didn't exist before are dramatic. They're not small-scale changes. These are dramatic changes. And organisms that undergo development do not like dramatic changes. There is no parent in this room. And I have a couple of daughters, both in their early 30s, and I now have a granddaughter <laughs> named Mars, <laughs> like the planet. <laughs> She's the god of war. Let me tell you, the girl is the god of war. <laughs> um, of course, I love her madly. There's no parent in this room who wants to be sitting in a birth suite and hear the doctor go, your child has a macro mutation. We know what the consequences of those kinds of changes are. We're a developing system. Nine months from fertilized egg to eight-pound baby. Right? and then another 16 years to reproductive capability. Macro mutations destroy developing systems. So the problem with heredity is the kinds of changes you would need to build a butterfly, whatever its precursor was, that species is not going to like the scale of change. Without successful reproduction, that necessary condition for natural selection, it can't, it can't operate, it can't. No selection, no evolution, at least not by the process of natural selection. Now, here's a metaphor that Ann Gager and I, one of my di discovery colleagues, came up with a few years ago to help people understand this when we were in the, the movie Metamorphosis. Any developing animal is crossing what you can call a vanishing bridge. This would be right at home in an Indiana Jones movie. As long as you keep walking on the vanishing bridge, you can get to the other side. If you stop or you look over the side, the, vi the, the bridge vanishes and down you go into the, uh, into the chasm, okay? So let's put the pupa here, because there's a lot more to happen before the butterfly is reproductively capable. And the, the reproductively capable adult butterfly is on the far side of the chasm. Now, Remember those three necessary conditions of natural selection, one of which is heredity. That's what happens when you don't keep moving, right? No one can stop at five months of development and stay there. If you, if you are, you know, a, a, a really early preemie, they're going to get you out and take care of you and try to get you all the way through what would otherwise be a normal nine months. You can't stop development and be normal, all right? Where's reproductive capability? It's over here on the far side of the bridge. So heredity itself, one of the necessary conditions of natural selection, is way over there. And so selection cannot build you that bridge until it's already in place. 
And this paradox has never been solved by evolutionary theory. I work on this professionally. In fact, for this talk, I did my homework. I thought, you know, well, it's 2025. We made that movie about, I don't know, 12 years ago. I better go check to see what's been published more recently. <laughs> I've got the paper. I'll bring it out to the speaker's table if anybody's interested. There was a major journal uh, piece where they had you know, 12 or 13 different authors working on this problem with respect to metamorphosis, and none of them could agree with each other. And the editors actually apologized in their opening article. They apologized to textbook writers. They said, we're sorry, but no one knows how this happened, and we can't tell you how it happened, so you're just going to have to wait for the answer. <laughs> I admire their honesty, but we've been waiting since Darwin for an answer to this puzzle, right? And the reason it can't be solved, I'll get to in just a moment. But if you think about this, if heredity is on the far side of that bridge, some other process has got to build you that bridge to get across it. How did natural selection do that? Well, it didn't do it. Because, again, you can't hold the theory responsible for how its practitioners use it. If you take the theory seriously, and you're a good and thorough and rigorous evolutionary biologist, you realize... I can't get over there by selection because heredity is on the far side. If you think about how real bridges are built, this is a big bridge in Korea. It's one of the longest uh, cable-stayed bridges in the world. Cable-stayed bridges, you attach the cables to the vertical pylons. It's not a suspension bridge technically because the cables aren't attached at the ends. They're attached in the middle. How do you build that? You know where you're going. <laughs> Right? You put the pylons in first, and then you gradually extend the bridge bed out on either side. Very, very carefully. You know where you're going before you start construction, and you know that every step has to occur in the right order to have a functional cable-stayed bridge. Here he is. I told you we'd get back to him. Here he is. He's going into his water box. What is he not going to let himself do? Houdini never died doing any of his stunts. He died because a college kid punched him in the stomach before he was ready to take the punch. He used to bet people, hit me as hard as you can right here in my solar plexus. I mean, it was kind of a, a joke that he would do with people. And this college kid and he were in a room and he said, go ahead and hit me. And he wasn't ready. He hadn't tightened up his muscles. The kid punched him and ruptured his internal organs, and he died of peritonitis. But he never died doing one of these stunts. He's not going to let himself die by drowning. In evolution, there's no dying. There's no crying in baseball. There's no dying in evolution. If your evolutionary pathway from A to B requires you to be lifeless for five minutes, you can rule out that hypothesis on those grounds alone. Again, be a careful and rigorous evolutionary biologist because the, 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 the theory does have rules. All right? He's not going in unless he knows how to get out because the alternative is dire. Okay? How do you get into the pupa unless you know how you're getting out? because you are digesting away almost all of your tissue. That's why that stage is so magical, because you have to know where you're going to get in, and you know that you're going to get out the other side so you can safely digest away most of your tissue because you have a plan to get out. Whatever caused that to be was a cause that knew where it was going. And evolution, my friends, does not know where it is going. By definition, it is an undirected natural process. It does not have a target. You know who has targets? Designers have targets. Once upon a time, this didn't exist, my little Huntington or Kensington clicker. And someone said, wouldn't it be great if people like Paul Nelson could have a little device that they held in their hand with a laser and, you know, buttons to advance their slides and so forth, and a power supply. What do we need to bring together to make this real? So you visualize mentally the target state, and then you actualize it by bringing together everything you need to achieve that target state. The pupa was not built by natural selection. 
The pupa and the butterfly and all of its beauty and precision engineering was built by a cause that knew where it was going. And in our universal experience, that is a mind. That is an intelligence. And you'll notice over the last... Praise God, I'm going to finish on time. Over the last 25 minutes, I haven't said a word about the Bible, even though I love the Bible. I haven't said a word about God, except a little bit at the beginning about the king that we serve. This is evidence. This is science. This is data calling for the best possible explanation. And I could give this same talk if they would let me at an evolutionary theory meeting and I would only have to leave out a couple of jokes about God as an engineer. He didn't hide his handiwork. He's not shy. He wants you to know. You know how bridges are built. That's how this is built, by a cause with foresight. And universally in our experience, that comes from a mind. And the, the, the mind that built monarchs was not in this room, right? The job description looks a lot like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you very much.